Yeah, you know, someone has to taste those things somewhere and be like, yeah, that, that is rotten egg. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Spill the Beans, the show where you never know what you'll get. My name is Dominic Gomez, and I am your host. In this show, we interview members of the Southwestern community while indulging in some delicious bean boozled jelly beans. And not only are we in a new filming location today back on campus, but we also have an incredible guest, the professor of political science and holder of the Lucy King Brown chair at Southwestern. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Eric Selvin. Dr. Selvin, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Before we get started, I'll explain how the show works. So I'm going to ask you five questions. Before answering each question, you and I will both eat one random jelly bean uh, from our individual boxes. But just so you know, there's no pressure to swallow or finish your jelly bean because I promise you it's completely random and you might not like what you get. Sounds great. All right, perfect. So let's get started. Um, so you've been with Southwestern for over 28 years now, and I think it's safe to say that over that time period, you've made a positive impact on a lot of your students. Are you aware that you're one of the top rated professors on RateMyProfessors.com? I was not aware of that, but that's really lovely to learn. So not only have 100% of your raters said that they would take one of your classes again, but many have left some inspiring advice for students looking to become Eric Selvin prodigies. So what we would like you to do is respond real time to some of your Rate My Professor ratings that we've pulled for you. Sound good? All right. Okay, and of course, before we start, it is bean time. It looks like I will be starting off with uh, either dead fish or strawberry banana smoothie. And mine would appear, how do you tell the difference between those two? Just kidding. And uh, my two seem to be rotten egg and buttered popcorn. Excellent choice for your first one. All right, in three, two, one, Shall let's we? read some of your reviews. Yep. That's strawberry wow. banana smoothie. And that is rotten egg. All right, well, our first review for you <laughs> is a perfect five score that says, Eric is not only a good professor, but an amazing mentor. His intro classes can be lacking because he doesn't like teaching comparative politics. <laughs> but his upper level Latin American classes are very thorough. He has been my favorite professor while at SU, despite only taking one of one class with him. Pro tip, read some of his work. It's a big deal. Your thoughts? Well, that's very generous. Um, it's true. Those six years that I taught uh, comparative politics every semester were not much more fun for me than they <laughs> were for the students. Um, I'm not really much of a comparativist anymore in the traditional sense. Um, I would say that um, I really love the notion uh, about uh, mentoring because I often think uh, that it's y'all that mentor me. And I feel like a, a number of students have mentored me over the years. So that's very cool, very generous. Well, let's keep moving. The next one says, Selbin is one of the best professors I've had at Southwestern. He gives amazing feedback and writes hilarious emails. Class participation not only helps your grade, but the whole classroom understand the material with better depth. Well, that's good to hear. I, my emails, which, yeah, I'm not sure what to say about the emails. They have certainly caused uh, much consternation and, <laughs> and much discussion over the years. I have a great time writing them. I'm always a little uh, unnerved by some of the responses I get to them, but I love writing the emails. <laughs> how, is, uh, how is your first bad bean? <clears throat> you know, it... That's, yeah, rotten egg. They, they've done a fine job. <laughs> Let's circle back to those emails. I think it's fair to say that most students at least get some enjoyment out of your cryptic yet colorful emails. Um, if writing valedictions was an art, you would have mastered it by now. And that goes to say that being a college professor, you're more than aware that sometimes you have to send emails that you don't necessarily want to send. So in your opinion, what's the best way to lighten the tone of an email for a group of sleep-deprived, stressed-out college students who already get a dozen emails a day? In other words, how does one craft the perfect Eric Selvin email? And of course, <sighs> before we answer that, it is once again bean time. All right. Uh, I seem to have, it's either going to be canned dog food or chocolate pudding. Would you look at that? Strength in numbers, I also have canned dog food or chocolate pudding. Let's talk about your emails in three, two, one. Canned dog food. Yeah. Wow. 
Wow, wow, wow. Pardon me for just a minute. That is so wrong. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. All right. Females. Emails. Um, so here's the thing. Um, when I first started writing emails, um, some students pointed out that they often seemed serious and kind of intimidating and whatever. <laughs> and so I thought about it and I thought, well, <clears throat> I could just try to write them like I talk, which is not always a great idea. But um, but to try to just speak with students where they are, but but to hopefully so make them interesting and amusing and to teach something, I try to always make sure there's something in there. The looks on your face are great. But to try to make something uh, interesting or that they'll remember. Um, I think it's important to to try to tell people what's coming. I think I have added over the years, I try to use numbers to help break things up a little more. Um, I try to sign off in interesting ways and and hopefully remind people that that all of this ought to be, I mean, I know this can sound silly, but all of this ought to be fun. Learning ought to be fun. Education ought to be fun. And we should be here as a community of scholars together, uh, learning and enjoying and thinking about stuff. So, so I try to make them fun. Now, having said that, I'm well aware that some people find them intimidating. Some people sometimes think I'm being overly sarcastic. Some people uh, think sometimes that I've lost my mind. And there you go. As, if, as long as I keep them interested, I figure I'm good. I think that's a great response. And I, I'd actually like to, to read to you um, some of my favorite Eric Selden uh, email valedictions. Um, so first we have here, Así que es abril a ese U, la lucha sigue. Hasta la victoria siempre. And finally, my, my personal favorite, Lost in the Ozone, Eric. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Of course. Thank you for uh, for putting them in my inbox. Um, that was a that was a very interesting flavor. Wow, I, I would not like to do that again. Well, I hate to tell you, but we, you might have to. Um, oh damn! Okay, uh, let's keep going. All right, so let's talk a bit about um, your own work as an academic. In 2010, you published Revolution, Rebellion, Resistance: The Power of Story, which gained international attention and was even described as a real achievement that should win a wide readership in a review from UC Berkeley. Can you elaborate a bit on the importance of stories and storytelling and empowering a movement? And how do you see stories reflected in everything happening in today's social climate? I know that's a loaded question and we'll get to it, but first, it is once again, bean time. This is either spoiled milk or coconut. <clears throat> well, I think I'm following in your steps from the first round and I now have rotten egg or buttered popcorn. So. I'm rooting for buttered popcorn for you, buddy. I appreciate it. All right. La lucha sigue in three, two, one. No. I was like... World milk. I am 0 for 3. Only room for improvement. All right, Dr. Selwyn, let's talk about storytelling and movements. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So, um, so I love, hate that book, which is sort of how I feel about everything I write. Um, and and that book is a is one that took it took about ten years to write. It blew apart several different times. I pulled out the whole middle third, which is still parked somewhere on my computer, and I'm going to do something with one of these days. Um, but the basic idea is that in trying to bring people back into the study of revolution, away from so much of a focus on states and institutions and structures, to try to think about how it is that people come to rise up to try to change the material and ideological conditions of their everyday lives. And, and I think a, a very powerful part of that are the stories people tell. I think people's revolutionary <coughs> imaginations is where things often begin. I think those shift into sort of sentiments as they begin to share and talk with each other. And then, and then as those coalesce into stories and, and not narratives, because I think narratives are, are cleaner and clearer than really what happens. But as those stories begin to come together in, in really often daring acts of bricolage, pulling lots of stuff, songs and symbols and places and dates and names um, and stories and more stories <laughs> together, then stories begin to emerge. And I think when there are compelling stories for people to articulate and build on and build around, then I think those revolutionary situations can actually become 
revolutions. Fascinating stuff. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Uh, so you're, you're 0 for 3 so far, huh? I am, man. This sucks. So let's move on. Um, All right. <laughs> so we, we've, we've covered some of the more well-known Selden facts. Uh, but perhaps what's lesser known about you is that during your undergraduate career at UT Austin, you were in a punk rock band developing alongside musical acts such as John D. Graham and the Skunks. When you think of all your memories from shows at Raul's on the Drag to Armadillo World Headquarters to the Continental Club, what would you say was your favorite part of the Austin music scene? And of course, wow. it is once again, bean time. Okay, wait, I gotta get a bean. No worries. Oh, I got, I got another of the spoiled milk coconut ones. Um, this one is Juicy Pear or Booger. Oh, damn. All right. Um, let's let's talk about some, some punk rock while doing something that is not very punk rock. All right. Wow, that's... Milk. Spoiled milk again. I am now 0 for 4. So Austin yeah. music scene. What are your thoughts? Wow. Um, you know, it was really... <laughs> it was an amazing time. It was the, the punk scene... Uh, in Austin in the late 70s was quite small and and kind of funny um, you know in places like the UK and even in New York um, you know it was it was a movement or moment freighted with politics and angst and other sorts of things in Austin it was mostly um, you know middle class and up white kids and um, so actually, at one point, there was a British band in town at one point, and we were out with them. And this one guy turned to a couple of us in the band I was in and was like, you're sort of like McPunks, aren't you? And it was like, ouch, but like also kind of accurate. Um, so, but it was small and it was a lot of fun. And so it also meant, I mean, Austin wasn't huge like it is now, but it was already a music place. And so, for example, bands like the Skunks that my friend John D was in, so John D had been in the band I was in. He moved on to the Skunks. I joined the band he had been in, Whippets. And um, but so the Skunks opened for a lot of these folks. And so getting to meet Patty Smith, getting to meet the Ramones, uh, we didn't get to meet the Clash. We would often come along to be roadies for the Skunks. That was our excuse for getting into these places. We That's come the end. Their, yeah, right. We would be their roadies and their guitar tuners. Not that it mattered whether your guitars were tuned. Trust me. But I think what I think probably an epic moment for me was we had gone to sound check for the Ramones because the skunks were going to open for the Ramones. And and, the, and we thought we were uh, part of our shtick was we were we were like the loudest band. We certainly weren't any good, but we were loud. We we're the loudest band in Austin. And the Ramones made the floor, the stage floor shake. They were so loud. The, the guitarist alone had 36 Marshall amps and it was just unlike anything I had ever seen or have ever seen. Uh, and it was fun. But, but the small size of the punk scene and, and getting to know all the people who came through and, and the chance to hang out with them was was really cool. Well, Dr. Selvin, unfortunately, that brings us to our final question, which also means that it is ultimate bean time. So here's how ultimate bean time works. You and I will both get three random jelly beans from our, our little boxes here. And we'll eat them all at once. And then we'll answer another question. All right. One seems to be either dirty dishwasher or birthday cake. One seems to be either booger or juicy pear. And one seems to be rotten egg or buttered popcorn again. Well, I have two of the canned dog food uh, chocolate pudding ones. But so I also sorry. have... I also have blueberry or toothpaste, which actually isn't that bad of one because it, it could just be mint. Right. In the scheme of things. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, All right. Tell me, tell me when we're ready. In three, two, one. It's ultimate bean time. Let's do it. Yeah. That's dog food again. Okay. All right, Dr. Selvin. We got one more question. Like we said, it's clear that you've left a lasting impact on many of your former students and you're quite admired by all of them. In fact, in 2012, the Alumni Association named you to the inaugural faculty fave five. And in 2012, they chose you to be Mr. Homecoming. What do you think this admiration says about the culture of Southwestern 
And how would you describe the Southwestern experience? That's a great question. You know, I, I would start by saying not all my students admire me, and I'm, I'm okay with that. I often try to tell my classes, you know, not every professor or every class is right for every student. Um, but I have a great deal of admiration for the students. And and I think with, with both those things, that Fave Five thing and the homecoming thing, and just my experience in general at Southwestern, has been that um, that it's a community. And, and that um, that even though it has not always been easy and there have been some difficult times, and I have certainly uh, stood up and argued and fought about a lot, <laughs> a lot of things uh, with colleagues and with the administration and sometimes with students, I've also been able to support colleagues and support staff and support students. And, um, and it's been really important to me to just be part of the community and have the opportunity to work with y'all in particular. I mean, that's why we're here. The reason the faculty are here you know, you're, you're at a school where most of the faculty here could be anywhere, could be at any institution they wanted to be. And part of the reason they're at a school like this is they wanted to be at a small liberal arts college to work with students like you and your colleagues. And so I think that, that that's such an important relationship and such an important dynamic. And I think it's part of what makes Southwestern uh, special. You know, most of my colleagues uh, went to small liberal arts colleges. I did not. But most of my colleagues went to small liberal arts colleges and they always knew they wanted to get back to, to a school like that to be a professor. And I think there's a reason for that. For me, it was when I was in graduate school and I met people who'd gone to schools like this and I saw the way their eyes lit up when they talked about them. And I thought, I mean, I grew up around a big state university, around LSU. I went to the University of Texas. I got my PhD at the University of Minnesota. I'd only ever experienced big school. I thought, I want to be at a place where students light up when they talk about where they went to school. And I think a big part of that is is the kind of school we are. And so to be part of that is, it's like that cheesy commercial, right? It's priceless. Dr. Selvin, a man of the people, and today a champion of Still the Beans. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. My name is Dominic Gomez. We'll see you next week with more awful questions and awful beans. <laughs>